Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 7th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain that while the federal infrastructure bill does bring significant benefits to Alaska, it also comes at some cost that needs to be accounted for as well. Second, we discuss some important assumptions built into the newly released analysis of the AKLNG project. And third, we explain our concerns about the recent push for a return to defined benefit programs for certain state employees. And now, let's join Michael. The weekly top three. What uh, I guess where where are we gonna where are we gonna start here? We're gonna talk about this federal infrastructure bill because everybody's talking about how great it was that we got all this federal. Look at who brought home the bacon. This reminds me of the whole Ted Stevens thing. Look at who's bringing home the bacon. Uh, you know, Murkowski and Young and everybody's touting it, and now they're gonna use it as a campaign slogan. But wait, wait, wait. You mean all this money's not free? I mean, not only is it printed money, not only is it not really tax dollars. In fact. Um, it's going to cost us some money on top of all that stuff. What's up? Yeah, so you were talking about the legislature not doing much. Last week was sort of a, a love fest uh, about uh, about the new federal infrastructure bill and, as you said, all of the money that it's going to, uh, going to bring into the state. Uh, there was also an economic report uh, that Musin Gatabi uh, published last week uh, that talked about the jobs impact of the federal infrastructure bill and said that uh, the job the the bill may bring uh, as much as fourteen thousand uh, additional jobs uh, to the state. So it's everybody's you know all excited about it, appropriately so, but all excited about the additional money and the and the projects and the uh, and the uh, potential for uh, money going out uh, uh, broadly in Alaska, both to uh, broadband uh, and to other projects uh, out west in Bush, Alaska. As well as uh, as well as projects in uh, urban Alaska, and the jobs uh, and the jobs related to that. But and, and here's it's here's a big the but. thing. Um, there's matching fund re- matching fund requirements. I mean, as uh, as Don Young, I think it was on the on the during the committee hearing last week, uh, where the the federal delegation Lisa and Sullivan and uh, and Don Young joined. I think Don Young said, now, remember, there's matching funds. And so, you know, I don't want to see the state, uh, you know, missing out on these opportunities by not uh, appropriating uh, uh, the matching funds. And lo and behold, those matching funds aren't in the budget yet. Um, in the 10-year plan <laughs> that, uh, that that Governor Dunleavy put out, they originally were going to put in, you can see it in the text of the 10-year plan, they were originally going to put in uh, $200 million a year um, as a placeholder, but there was a very inconvenient thing that happened when they did that. The, the budgets didn't balance anymore. <laughs> the, uh, even with the PFD cuts that he had in there going down to uh, POMV 5050, um, uh, as well as, uh, as, as well as the suppressed, uh, inflation factor that they had in there. Uh, when you put in the 200, the $200 million for, uh, for the matching funds, the budgets didn't balance. So they, so it's in the text. That they, that they were going to create this placeholder uh, for the $200 million, but it's not in the numbers. It, it doesn't follow through uh, uh, in the numbers. And it's not in the, uh, it's not in the, in the current uh, the FY23 uh, budget either. So um, we, we've got, I mean, all of this stuff is good. It's great to have this additional money. 
um, uh, and it's going to you know produce nice projects and jobs. But the state's going to have to come up with its matching amount. It hasn't yet, uh, and the question is going to be: Is that matching amount going to come out of other programs, or uh, in the absence of uh, of substitute revenues, is it going to come out of the PFD? Because <laughs> um, that's I mean that's that's the, that's the place it's got to come out of if we don't have if we don't have substitute revenues um, and we don't take it out of other programs. So there, there's a big issue sitting out there on the state side and, and to be, and, and, and to sort of, sort of put this in context, this is the sort of thing that happened with the, the, the Medicaid program over the, or the Medicare, whatever, whichever it is, the, the, the state, the state uh, 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 programs that uh, have built up around Medicaid uh, over the years. I mean, each time, that that there was a new program, Ted Stevens came back, or a new add-on that the state that the federal government would match if the state added this program to its Medicaid programs. Um, each time, Ted Stevens came back and said, "Hey, there's this brand new program that we just passed in Congress. Um, we'll give you federal matching funds. All you have to do is come up with a you know 50% uh, uh, state uh, state share, uh, and then we get all this additional money coming into the state." And in step by step by step over the decades, that's how we got a, a, a Medicaid program that is that is the, you know, has, has the most options. Alaska has the most options, Medicaid options, adopted the most Medicaid options of, of any state. Right. Um, they're well, all, you know, it, it brings federal funds in, but. But we build up all these state programs. Well, uh, and the worst to, part, the worst part of that kind of stuff, Brad, is when they say, "Oh, look, we've got this brand new federal program, and it's great and groovy, and all you got to do is you got to pony up not fifty percent. Sometimes it's only ten percent or twenty percent. And wouldn't it be great?" And somebody says, "Well, yeah, but what about the funding?" And the, oh, don't worry about that. And then three or four or five years down the road, the federal funding starts ratcheting down and down and down, and now all of a sudden, Alaska's on the hook for not. 20% of the program, but maybe 80% or a hundred percent of the program because there's been no, f there's no federal funds for it. And now they're like, well, you can't kill the program now because there are people who are dependent on that. You can't do yep, it. I exactly. mean, that, that's exactly where we're at. Exactly right. At these transportation programs, I mean, they're talking about mostly 10% state match uh, to the, to the transportation uh, uh, piece uh, at least. And, um, uh, and so it's, you know, and, and so the, the pitch is, it's not that much. Well, you know, the, at least the Dunleavy administration at one point thought it was $200 million a year, which is quite a bit. <laughs> um, and, and so we're, it, 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 we get all excited about these programs and I'm not, I'm not trying to knock the programs and I'm not trying to knock what the federal delegation did. And I'm not trying to say, you know, uh, uh, these are, these are, are bad things, but, but there's a, there's another side of it. That, that we very seldom step up to and, and recognize. And this is going to be in, 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 the, in the tight budgets that we've created uh, over, the, over the past decade, uh, well, longer than that, in the tight budgets that we've created, $200 million is a big deal. Um, and coming up with that $200 million, I mean, how are we going to do that uh, is, uh, is going to be a, a big deal and a big issue. And, and so, we need to recognize that these are not these are not costless uh, programs to uh, Alaska. There is a cost, and as I say, you know, in the absence of substitute revenues and in the absence of cutting it out of other programs, and the Dunleavy administration hasn't proposed to do that, uh, it's going to come out of the PFD. So, so basically, basically, we have middle and lower income Alaska families that are going to end up having to uh, having to pay for uh, for all of this uh, goodness. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's that's going to descend on us. So all this free money? Wait, wait! It's not free, and in fact, it's not only not free; it's hitting the lowest and middle income folks hardest in the state of Alaska because that's the answer. I mean, that's really, and yet they get to pound their chests and brag about how all the money they brought. Look at us! Look at what we did! Look at all the good stuff! Uh, I mean, there's groups out there that are touting Murkowski for look at all she did for. Uh, you know, some independent expenditures that are like, look at all she did for bringing this infrastructure to Alaska. Meanwhile, uh, people are getting hit in the economy. And and it just, again, it just, it blows my mind that this is the thing that we continue to fall for uh, in this cycle of pain. <laughs> I mean, really, this is the thing we continue to, this is the cycle of pain we just can't get out of. 
it's sort of like the Charlie Brown. I mean, what you're 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 describing is sort of like the Charlie Brown episode where yeah. you know, Lucy's Lucy's holding the ball. And yeah, one more time, Charlie come Ro- on, Charlie, one more time. I promise not to yank it out. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's uh, that's the way it is. Well, it should be it should be a wake up call. I mean, everything should be a wake up call given where we are, but it should be yet another wake up call. It should be, hey, we're getting all these federal funds, but it's going to cost us $200 million a year. Where's that going to come from? Oh my God, it's going to come from the PFD. Um, uh, shouldn't we be talking about longer term fixes to our budget so that every, you know, incremental dollar that, uh, that, uh, that comes out of, uh, uh, comes out of the budget isn't coming out of middle and lower income Alaska families. It should be a wake up call to fix our budget. It's not going to be. Uh, I mean, no, I don't think, no. I, other than uh, Don Young, I don't recall anybody mentioning the state uh, matching funds uh, at, uh, at Friday's uh, hearing slash love fest. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it, we need, we need to temper our excitement about uh, all these federal funds coming in with a recognition that there is going to be a cost on the state side. Right. I mean, wait, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, there's no such thing as free money. I mean, I mean, one way or the other, we're going to pay for this. And and again, matching funds and the fact that we're printing money to do this and borrowing and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, I I do not look at this. I do not look at these dollars coming into the state with the uh, with the reverence that many people seem to. Oh, look at all the great stuff it's going to do for the state. All I can think of is that every time we spend that dollar, we're borrowing, you know, whatever it is, 60 percent of that dollar to do it. And uh, it just it blows my mind. So. All right. Well. Uh, we'll be asking some questions of politicians about how they are going to find that two hundred million dollars for the federal match, and uh, you know what are we going to do about that? So we'll we'll ask those questions of the politicians as we go through here. Let's go ahead and give us a tease for number two, the latest news around the Alaska LNG projects uh, around the state. So the 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 uh, Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, I think that's the current name of it. Um, Last week, uh, uh, announced uh, the results of a new uh, uh, Wood McKenzie study. Uh, Wood McKenzie is one of the best consultants out there. Uh, a new Wood, uh, Wood McKenzie study on uh, on the LNG project and uh, and and announced some uh, developments that they claim made the project they claim makes the project a lot more competitive. Uh, there's a couple of issues with that uh, and uh, a couple of big issues with that, uh, and we're going to discuss that in the second segment. Uh, isn't there always big issues when we're talking about Alaska LNG and, and all that? I mean, we've tried to develop that. I remember I still, I think it was Jim Whitaker that had the picture from the news miner uh, framed on the back of his wall of his office. It said something about gas line next year. And it was the news miner from 1959 or something. It was just like, you know, <laughs> we've been talking about this for, I mean, God knows how long. But we're continuing now uh, talking with him, the weekly top three. We just finished up talking about all those federal matching funds, and uh, we were teased about uh, the Alaska LNG project by Brad, and so now he's going to uh, dive back into it and give us the real deal on what's happening with AKLNG. Brad, uh, what's what's the scoop here? So the new, anal- the new analysis that the project has done is, is looking at a different uh, commercial structure for the project than, than they have before. Uh, previously, the project was anticipated to be upstream owned. That is, the producers would own the project, uh, produce the, the 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 gas, be transported down the line. That was in part producer owned, in part state owned. That was the that was the Walker vision. Uh, taken down to uh, Kenai, where an LN- a liqu- liquefaction plant would liquefy the the gas and uh, and ship it out to the to the Far East. Uh, they they've they've played with that project design and now they've stepped away from the producer or the upstream owned uh, concept and and basically they're turning it into a utility uh, that would be just uh, involved only in uh, cleaning up the gas on the north slope uh, transporting it pipelining it down to Kenai and then having the liquefaction liquefaction plant at Kenai physically the same facilities but commercially those those facilities would be owned by a separate company a project company um, that would uh, make its money through a tolling arrangement or a transportation arrangement or a fee arrangement 
with either the producers on the one end, if they wanted to own the product all the way, uh, if they wanted to own the product to, to sell to the uh, to sell the consumers, or potentially consumers who would buy the the, the LNG consumers who would buy the product up on the slope, um, and uh, and then arrange a contract with the uh, with the owner of the of the facilities to uh, transport it and liquefy it uh, at uh, at Kenai uh, and, and put it on ships down there. That new commercial structure, they think, lowers the cost because they can do what they call project finance uh, that cost that would be based upon the, the toll arrangements as opposed to as opposed to based upon uh, uh, some other arrangement, uh, the producers putting money into it um, and would lower the cost as a result of being project finance. They've also, uh, uh, as part of the uh, Infrastructure Act, as part of the Part of the bill that just passed Congress, Congress changed the the law so that the federal uh, loan guarantees uh, uh, that previously applied only to a pipeline that 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 went to the lower 48 now can apply to this LNG project as well, um, and that would help. The, the federal loan guarantees would help lower the cost. The net result of of of, ver of those various steps. Uh, is to reduce the cost of the projected cost of the of the project below the projected cost of new projects uh, uh, in the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, a combination of lowering the cost in that fashion and uh, the transportation advantage that Alaska has uh, over uh, over uh, U.S. Gulf Coast projects. We don't have to go through the Panama Canal, for example, which has a right. fairly substantial fee structure, uh, and make the project uh, more competitive uh, in that fashion. But there's two things uh, about the about the, the revised uh, uh, project or about the new commercial arrangements that are that are important um, and significant and 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 to some degree troublesome. One is uh, that as part of lowering the cost of the project to make it competitive, they assume that the gas price uh, uh, for the for the for the gas that would go into the project uh, is lowered from two dollars, which is what they used to assume, down to one dollar. So there would only be a one dollar net back on gas uh, back to the producers. That means the states take uh, in terms of royalty uh, and uh, and production tax would be lowered substantially uh, from what it was assumed uh, in in the previous cases. So frankly, a significant part of the increased competitiveness of the project that they're touting is coming at the expense of both the producers on the on the slope. Uh, and at the expense of the state in terms of a in terms of a, a of a lower take, it's not clear that uh, the producers are willing to sell the gas uh, for a dollar. I mean, they've got the producers have uh, obviously there's a lot of gas behind pipe uh, uh, that can be produced from existing facilities both in Prudhoe and in Point Thompson, but but not nearly all of the gas you would need for the life of the project can be is is sitting behind pipe right now. So you're going to have to go out and develop additional gas supplies. Right. And the question, the question is whether producers are going to be willing to do that for a dollar. So that's that's one that's one significant factor. The second is they've assumed a lower cost uh, in part as a result of dropping the property taxes that would be assessed by the localities and the state uh, down to a to a much lower level, a level that they say is competitive with what's going on in Texas and Louisiana, where a lot of new projects are being built right now, but significantly lower than what I think we've assumed before. Uh, in the Alaska project, so we're making it more competitive, but that's in part at the expense of uh, of the state in terms of revenues, and in part in terms of local governments. Isn't it almost better to say we are theoretically making it more affordable? I mean, again, this assumption that we're going to cut the net back cost in half, and again, potentially drop it. I mean, there would have to be some agreements with these boroughs uh, and and the municipalities on the on the taxation and state on the taxation issues. That would have maybe a twenty-year lifespan or something like that, you know, like a you know first in, or for you get a you get a tax exemption for X number of years for building it, but eventually that's going to go away. So it's got to pencil out early on, and you got to get a lot of people to say yes, Brad. And we've seen, like I said earlier, it was always interesting to see that full-page ad in the Daily News Miner from 1959 that says we'll have gas next year, um, and and here we are, sixty years later. 70 years later without the gas. I mean, there's a lot of ifs in there. Yeah, they're, they're, they're in a marketing mode. I mean, they're trying to sell this project. Now that the state has gotten it sort of packaged up in a way, they're trying to sell this project. And frankly, part of what's going on here is, 
what have I got to do? <laughs> where, where can I bleed costs out in right. order to make this thing, in order to make this thing look competitive? And, and that's, and that's what they're doing with, by assuming the, uh, the lower, uh, the lower net back to the producers and uh, by assuming, uh, assuming a lower, uh, a lower property tax as well. It, it, it may, I mean, it, if you make those assumptions, and you and you change the commercial design in a way to lower the cost of the of the, the financing cost of the project, which is what going to a project finance project does. If you make those assumptions, it does pencil out to be lower than the than the, than Gulf Coast projects, not by a huge amount, but by enough to make a make a difference. So they may be able to entice somebody in here and and uh, and 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 pick up the project at this point. But uh, but that's what's going on. They're trying to make it look competitive. Uh, and uh, and in doing well, so, uh, making making some assumptions. Seventeen trillion cubic feet of uh, gas on the North Slope that we could do something with um, eventually. Again, if they're willing to part with it, and they're willing to part with it for the dollar amounts that you've speculated about, um, should be interesting. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. Maybe we won't have to wait another seventy years before we see that headline again. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about uh, number three today, and this is one that I've got a little bit of a heartburn about. And this is this discussion about whether or not we should we should uh, reestablish defined benefit programs or a limited defined benefit programs. I mean, defined benefit programs is what got our pension system in such an uproar and had us upside down so badly. We're slowly whittled away at that billions and billions of dollars uh, to where we're now. It seems to be more manageable. And of course, every year somebody else brings up the fact that we should go back to defined benefit. The problem that I mean, it's what's what created the problem in the first place. Now there's a case for reestablishing it in a limited way, uh, I guess for mostly for first responders and public safety. Let's talk about this. So there's a bill in the legislature that seems to be getting some traction uh, that would reestablish defined benefit plans for public safety officers. And the argument is that uh, Alaska is not competitive, <clears throat> uh, not competitive to retain public safety officers. We, we police and, and fire, we get them. Uh, we get them in. Uh, we get them employed. Uh, they start working for us. They start getting trained. They start getting some experience, uh, and then they're attracted to go elsewhere to uh, to other states or other localities because we don't have a competitive package uh, compensation package. Is the argument uh, to retain them here? And and the key part, according to the argument, the key part that we don't have is a defined benefit program. That the uh, uh, that it's a, a, a that, that other localities are offering those we aren't. Uh, and so getting the people are getting their training here, they're, they're getting some work experience here and then they're parlaying that into employment elsewhere and, uh, and leaving Alaska and leaving us with, as a result, uh, a, a lower trained workforce than we otherwise would have a more costly workforce because turnover is costly. You have to go out and, and, you know, constantly bring in new people. Um, and so that's that's the argument, and the bill's making some uh, headway as a result of that. It, it's it's sort of the crack in the door, though. I mean, you can see the teachers sitting there, waiting for because teachers don't have defined benefit right. either, um, and and in fact, teachers a lot of teachers in the state don't have social security either. So you can see the teachers sitting there going, okay, well, let's get this done for for first responders. Let's sort of make them the wedge that gets the door open and then we're going to start bringing the teachers in because the same argument, the teachers are making the same argument that, that we're having a lot of turnover in the state because, you know, we start, we train teachers, we, we, we give them experience and then they, then they move outside for, for better compensation packages because we don't have defined benefits here. It's a debate. It's a debate we need to have, but the other part of the debate needs to be show me that we don't get ourselves right back into the situation that we've got now uh, that we still have, which is, you know, this huge uh, 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 hole in our, in our confidence, in our, in our benefit, in our, in our retirement plans that we're having to fill every year by making annual contributions out of the state budget right? of, of not, of not insignificant amounts. Even now we're in the $200 million range. So you, you show us the cost benefit that, that we're not getting our, that, that, you know, all of the costs that you say are coming as a result of having to train new people and the turnover and the costs associated with turnover, show us that that's more costly than the cost of having the defined benefit plan. And then show us how we're going to make sure that this defined benefit plan doesn't create a hole uh, going forward. So we're not just saddling future generations with the same problem uh, 
uh, we've had. I've not seen that case made yet. No, uh, and for, I, uh, I think they'll have a hard time making that case, quite honestly, because we've seen it. We've seen, seen defined benefit programs across the country basically be subsumed. I mean, Delta and GM both turned their defined benefits programs over to federal management to then be able to change to a defined contribution. We've seen defined benefits programs basically eat whole budgets, and we just know that it is a, it is a hazardous road to walk, you know. Well, it's, it's eating our budget. I mean, up until 2013, we were projecting a billion dollars a year. There was a projection of a billion dollars a year that we were going to have to additional, right, right. that we were going to have to set aside to cover the whole. We, we handled that by making a lump sum $3 billion contribution uh, in 2013 or 2014, whichever it was, uh, over to the benefit and sort of stemmed the tide. Uh, and we've had good stock markets since then, so it's sort of gone down a little bit more. But um, you know, we, we, we need we need to have a handle that we're not going right in, back into this situation uh, going forward before uh, before we go down this road. This is always, you know, of course, they've been wanting to change back on this, Brad, on this benefits program for years. I mean, ever since it was to change to defined contribution, people immediately started squawking about. I mean, even though there was a $12 billion elephant in the room, they were like, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. We need to take care of these employees no matter what. And that's the only way we'll get a good employees if we keep the defined benefit. Again, if you look at the history of defined benefits across the country, you could see that defined benefits... Uh, like I said, they they ate whole economies. They ate whole budgets. Uh, you know, all the all the big majors who had had them, including GM and Delta, the two biggest ones that I think about, they had to turn theirs over to the federal government because it was going to eat them, and they had to get they had to have wholesale changes to it. This is just not something that we should lightly embrace at this point. Exactly right, Michael. And and, and the reason that we haven't had as much publicity about them in recent years as we did back in the in the 20 teens uh, is because the stock market has done so well. So all of these pension funds, all of the state pension funds that have been set aside have, have done well. Ours has done well uh, at, during, uh, during the build up to the stock market. If the stock market goes back, if, if the investment community investment returns uh, sort of level, sort of levelize again or go back down again, uh, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about these pension funds again. Because basically, it's a bet. The defined benefit programs are a bet. Can can you get the returns necessary in in your investment portfolio to stay even with, if not a little bit ahead of the obligation you have you've created through uh, through these defined benefits? Right. And and so and so it's a bet that, that's good and and you know, and 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 works when the stock when in the investment portfolio is up. It's a bet that doesn't work so well when the investment portfolio is down, um, and um, and so the question is whether the state wants to take on this risk, and and other states have, and you know not every but not every defined benefit program has gone down the tubes, um, and and other states have, and and there's a competitiveness issue about it, but but to, before we go down this road again, show us that that you've got you've got us you've got a plan to keep us between the ditches where we don't run off the road again and run in, in this huge hole again. And I don't, you know, there's been a lot about, oh, we need this to be competitive. We've got too much turnover. We've got, you know, we're losing police. We're losing fire. We're training, we're going through the expense of training them up here. And then they, and then they go elsewhere. We got a lot of, a lot of churning about that issue. We don't have the same amount of, of activity and focus on the, uh, on the cost side, and, right, um, and and we and we need that before we go down this road again. Well, and of course, with Alaska's defined benefits, particularly, it was the it was the healthcare that was the driver on a lot of that stuff, and we have no idea where it's going. I mean, it could be going up, it could be stabilizing, but I mean, it's probably a good bet if you want to bet on the on history. It's a good bet that it's going to go up higher than anybody expects, just because as things advance, it gets more expensive. That's that's just how it works, and so to just opened up, uh, open ourselves up to that, and assume everything's going to be okay. Not a not a not a good bet, in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's an assumption of risk, right? I mean, who's going to take the risk of the future? Is it going to be the employer, the government, uh, or is it going to be uh, the individual uh, who, you know, under a defined contribution plan, can make con- can make uh, contributions for themselves and you know and, and run their own uh, investment portfolio? Um, and and a lot of other places do make it the government's risk. The government is the one that assumes the risk. They make it part of the, part of the compensation package. But uh, you know, we 
once bitten, we ought to be twice shy about. Uh, <laughs> well, not to mention about, the fact about, that we've already got yeah. it out there, right? We've already got, we already have our current, you know, snowball of money out there that we're trying to constantly keep up on. And now you want to, if we had no pension debt, it would be one thing. But to now say, well, we need to start this up, even though we're still paying off a couple $3 billion of pension debt that's still out there or unfunded liability that's still out there. I mean, we have to be extra cautious at that point. Oh, we do. I mean, because 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 we're knowledgeable. I mean, we're we're on notice. This thing can go bad, um, and it's not like we have a lot of a, a lot of give in our budget, right? To to be wrong about this. So, yes, there are there are no doubt additional costs as a result of employee churn. There's no no doubt there are additional costs, but there are huge potential additional costs coming from going to defined benefit to avoid uh, what might be in comparison to relatively minor costs from uh, from the churning. Yeah. Um, and so and, and we we just need to make that calculation. And as I say, I've looked for it and I've not been sold uh, that uh, that we're that we're doing uh, that we're doing the calculation right yet. Well, until they can show you that on paper and show you how it uh, how it should work and hold us harmless, then uh, I guess we should be ignoring that for sure. All right. Well, yeah. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, my friend, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, it's great to hear from you, Michael, uh, as always. Thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.